welcome to the 20th lecture on molecules in motion. Uh, we have discussed the uh, number of things previously about strong electrolyte, weak electrolytes and then we had moved on to discussing the mobilities of iron in the last class we had just begun. What we were talking about is when you have a charged particles, we what, what we are interested in looking into is the interpretation of transfer of a uh, transport of charge and these charges are uh, ca ca carried by the ions in solution which is an electrolyte when you have supplied electricity across the two electrodes which is dipped into the electrolyte solution. So, what happens is we interpret the transfer in terms of as we have discussed previously in terms of the amount of charge which is carried and on the speed at which the charge is carried. The speed at which it is carried means we talk about the movement of the ions or the mobility of the ions. In the last class what we talked about was the drift speed. The drift speed is the speed which the ions are going to acquire the ultimate speed when the forces on the ions are balanced. What are the forces which are acting on the ions? One is the exhilarating force and another is a retarding force and when these two uh, forces balance then we apply the Stokes law and derive an expression for the terminal speed or the uniform speed which we the particles or ions are going to move with. So, the exhilarating force is what? It is the force which is experienced by the charged particles on application of an electric field and this electric field is nothing but the potential gradient d phi by L and if the total charge is uh, Z e then Z e into d phi by L is equal to the force which is acting on the particle which is accelerating the particle to move from one end to another like from one electrode point to another get plus charge moving to the negative electrode minus charge moving to the positive electrode. Now, this is the force which is the acting to accelerate the ions for movement. Another force which is there when whenever we are talking about a liquid we are talking about a system which is going to have some viscosity. So, this uh, ions when they are moving in the solution medium then they are going to ex experience a drag force this is a viscous drag which is associated and this viscous drag is the similar to what you have done in Stokes law when you have a small spherical particle moving in a, a fluid medium then what happens? they reach a terminal velocity when the bound force and the frictional force is balanced by the gravitational force. So, th the same uh, ex experience we are going to be using or same expressions we are going to be or same logic we are going to use. So, what we have here is the frictional force which is existing in the fluid system. This is the, fr uh, the fr friction parameter and this is the speed with which it is moving, this is the, uh, the terminal speed which we are having. So, when we want to acquire the terminal speed what is the requirement that the net force acting on the charge particle should be 0 and that will be 0 when the accelerating force is equal to the retarding force. So, this is the accelerating force and this is the retarding force, we equated these two and we got a expression for the speed terminal speed which we called as the drift speed and that drift speed is nothing but the, uh, the charge Z into the electronic charge E electric field applied by the F, F is the frictional parameter okay, associated with the medium. So, it is the characteristics of the medium and also of the particle which we are looking into. So, here you can see what is the expression of uh, F, 
this is again from whatever we have you have learned from Stokes law. This f expression is 6 pi a eta, eta is the coefficient of viscosity of the medium and a, a is the radius of the particle which we are interested in. Okay. When it is in the, uh, the when the solvent is water then we call this as the hydrodynamic radius. Okay. So, this is what we had done in the last class. We are going to discuss few points on this and then we will move on to further things. So, what we can uh, have a look uh, is when we are trying to talk about a terminal speed, we are talking about the speed of the particle which is in the medium. We do not uh, relate to that, uh, that speed to any of the parameters which we can measure. So, how are we going to relate that? We introduce a new term, the ionic mobility u and u is defined, it is a definition mind you, u is defined as given in the expression like this. That means, drift speed is equal to the ionic mobility into the applied electric field. Applied electric field is what? It is the potential gradient ac across the length between the two electrodes. Okay. So, from here we can find out the value of the uh, ionic mobility from this expression. The ionic mobility is nothing but the drift speed by the electric field. So, if you see here this expression of S also has a, this is the expression F, a, F S we have derived in the previous slide this is the expression of S. So, we apply that S here and we see that the E E part is going to be cancelling off. So, what we are left with is the Z the charge into the electronic charge divided by 6 pi eta, eta naught is the solvent which we are using the viscosity of that viscosity coefficient of that solvent and A is the radius of the ion which we are looking into. So, this is the expression which we have and you see if you look into the terminal uh, the, in the ionic mobilities you can see these parameters which are uh, written here meter square per second inverse per volt inverse. These are the parameters uh, have a look at them we are going to discuss them in a while from now. If you see them here we see whichever is going to be a parameter which is going to be directly affecting the uh, drift speed is going to affect the mobility of the ions. So, you see here A is a term which is inversely proportional to the drift speed and also the viscosity. Again the charge of the particle is directly proportional to this drift speed. That means, if I decrease these two I should have a increase in this and if I have an increase in this that is a drift speed then I have an increase in the mobility of the ions. And you have a look at this values, these are the ionic uh, ions we are looking into and these are the mobilities associated. You see the H plus ion and OH minus ion despite having the same charge I am having a slight lesser uh, value. So, if this is small value, this is the smallest of the ions which can we have, we can have in the periodic table. This is supposed to be smallest, if this is the smallest then this should be the highest, is it so? Is it always so? What is going to be seen in the next two? Uh, examples is going to make it more clear what the trends should be. Before we proceed into discussion further, what we finally would like to uh, relate is how the ionic mobilities which we have calculated, which we have calculated from the drift speed is going to be connected to the conductivity, molar conductivities. So, because molar conductivity is the final form which we are going to measure. So, 
that is what how we, we are interpreting the charge transfer. So, this is one of the measurable parameters. So, we would like to look into a relationship between the mobility which we have derived the expression for uh, from the drift speed connecting that to the molar conductivity. And this is some expression which I am going to be uh, discussing in detail how to derive this, but just for now let us keep it simple just take it that the molar conductivity lambda is nothing but z u f, u is the ionic mobility, f is the Faraday constant and z is the charge. Okay. So, what we are looking into? We are looking into a, a charge particles separated across this line. These are the two electrodes which we have. We are going to look into more details of how the movements are taking place. Just have a look at the diagram just for now. This expression we are going to derive, but what, what we uh, want to relate a few more relationships to before we begin with explaining the parameters. So, what we have? We have the relation between the ionic mobility as well as the molar conductivity. If, a, if for a system, if, a, if we apply for a system uh, where we can uh, we have infinite dilution, then what happens? Then we can say the molar conductivity approaches the uh, limiting value that is the molar conductivity at infinite dilution, which is signified by a naught. So, according to Kohler-Rosch's law of independent migration of ions we have already seen before that it is defined as when at infinite dilution the limiting value of the molar conductivity is nothing but the conductivity of individual ions the cation and the anion at the limiting state. This is also the uh, limiting value of the um, uh, ionic uh, conductivity of the cation and this is the limiting value of the ionic mobility of the anion. And these are the parameters which is obtained from the formula unit of the uh, electrolyte system which we are dealing with. So, if you use this uh, definition, uh, uh, if, if you apply this uh, uh, Rosch's law in your definition which we have right now, we have not proved how we have got that, but we have taken this is the expression for the molar conductivity. Then you see if I want to do it for a dilute uh, system very dilute uh, condition, then what happens? This will be the molar in, in a limiting value of the molar conductivity, conductivity will be nothing but it, it should be in terms of z u f. So, you have z u and f is outside because you have both cation and anion present and when the, we are talking about infinite dilution, then we have to take the contribution of the cation and the anion and the cation and anion will both have different values of uh, ionic mobility u. And so, this expression becomes on application of uh, Kohler-Rosch's law, this expression can be rewritten as something like this. Now, if you have a system where z plus equal to z minus equal to z, they are 1, 1, 1 suppose, then what we have? Then this expression becomes much simplified, then you have the mobilities of the cation and the mobilities of the anion into z f. So, these are expressions which we usually uh, apply when we are doing numericals and these are uh, things which uh, make your problem solving easier. So, taking this in uh, keeping this in mind, we are going to discuss few things and then finally, come to the derivation of the relation between ionic mobility u and the molar conductivity. So, what we have here? We would like to express whatever data we have whatever interpretations we have is from some measurement. Okay. So, for measurement we need uh, some instrument. So, which is the instrument which is most readily available 
to understand the mobilities of ions is a conductometer. So, that means molar conductivity is a parameter which is the most easily measurable for an electrolyte system. So, whatever interpretations we have, we will try to bring it down to the molar conductivity units. So, what we have previously generated is the ionic mobility, we have a definition. We have also deri without deriving, we have taken the expression of the molar conductivity being equal to z into the, there is a charge u the ionic mobility into the Faraday constant. So, I have two, uh, uh, two expressions here, here I have u, I have u, u here. So, I now combine these two, I can put the value of u in this expression and get a value of u in terms of the lambda. Lambda is what we are looking into. So, lambda new expression of lambda can be obtained when we substitute u for the things we know from the previous derivations or previous expressions we have. So, z u f is can be now replaced by s by u, s by e is the uh, ionic mobility. So, you substitute s by e and uh, then you multiply it by f. And if you put the value of s here in the previous expressions we have derived, uh, what is the expression for s? So, put the expression of s, then what you see is you can now relate the molar conductivity with the expressions of some terms which you have already dealing with. Only thing is here now you see z, you have a z here, you have a z here. So, the z becomes square, you have e from this expression of s and then you have the denominator coming from the expression of s. Okay. Now, what we have here is a, a function uh, which we can relate to and try to explain the observations for an electrolyte system. As the drift speed governs the charge transport, because that is the speed with which the charge is transported, that therefore, any parameter that affects the drift speed will affect eventually the conductivity of the electrolyte. Because you see the drift speed is directly proportional to u and u is directly proportional to the lambda. So, molar conductivity is expected to decrease with increasing in the solvent viscosity. That is obvious from the expression which we have. Okay. The uh, expression which we have here is uh, the expression which we have here is, is, is having a eta is in the denominator. So, if you increase the viscosity, then the conduct molar conductivity value lambda should decrease. Same is for the ionic size or radius. If you have a large size, then you will have lower value of lambda. Okay. So, increasing in uh, ionic size will decrease the molar conductivity. Now, let us see for individual cases what we have uh, mentioned in the last class, but we did not go in for <coughs> detail explaining. So, usually when you see, uh, if you look at the uh, cation and anion, if you go through books, you will see that cation is usually a smaller size. Okay. The cations are usually a smaller size, while the anions are usually a bigger size. Why it is, why cations are a uh, smaller size and why anions are bigger size is probably some sort of, uh, we can talk in terms of the shielding effect. If you have, uh, a cation has uh, an electron loss, so the effective nuclear charge 
is going to be experienced by the valence uh, electrons will be much stronger than th uh, those of when you are adding mm, an electron that means n ion then the effective uh, uh, force which is interact uh, in which is there with uh, coulombic interaction between the nucleus the positively charged nucleus and the valence electron is going to be uh, more than what you should be requiring for a balance so probably that is one of the reasons we can say about uh, the big uh, anions being of larger size so cations have smaller values of mobility uh, for the anions uh, except for hydronium ion which we are going to dis discuss. So, the cations have smaller values of u that means mobility than for the anions. This indicates the cations are more hydrated than anions. If you see the expression, please keep the expression in mind. This is supposed to be smaller and a cation is smaller. So, this should be higher right and what we are saying here? We are saying the cation has a lower mobility. Why should it have a lower mobility? For the same system if I have water as the solvent, why should a cation have lower mobility if the sizes are smaller? This indicates that what the um, size we are talking about, since the size of uh, uh, ion is very difficult to define or any atom it is very difficult to define because we are assuming them to be spherical hard balls, but in reality they do not have a fixed boundary right. So, it is uh, when we are talking about a cation we are talking about a, 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 um, a positive charge surrounded by a solvent molecules ok. So, when you have a smaller value of the uh, uh, smaller size of the cation that means the cations is in comparison to the anions since the cations are of smaller size the mobilities should be higher, but instead what we see that the mobilities are lower than the comparatively lower than the anions ok of the same uh, charge I am talking about um, 1 minus and 1 plus if only the if the charges are on this um, on the at ions are the same we cannot really compare if the one of them is plus charge plus 2 and another one is minus 1 it it doesn't make sense to compare then you need to look into my, uh, other parameters when we are comparing when i'm when we are comparing we are to, uh, a cation and an ion we are uh, by default talking about having the same charge minus 1 minus 1 a plus 1 mi minus 2 pl plus 2. So, cations with having smaller size uh, smaller mobility in spite of having a smaller size indicates that cations are more hydrated that they get solvated more than the anions. Small size of the cation produce more intense electric field around it and therefore, hold the water molecules uh, more uh, tightly than that the anions ok. So, what we, whatever we have talked about in Stokes law is not able to explain to in according to Stokes law A is inversely proportional to the um, say mobility or conductivity. Here we cannot <coughs> say the same is applied only because we are not talking about the uh, radius of the ions, but we are talking about the radius of the hydrated ions ok. So, this modification has to be included when we are talking about applying the Stokes law. Suppose we have a bulky molecule like you have um, uh, some uh, quant uh, quaternary uh, ammonium salt. So, you have some uh, uh, bulky uh, molecule for these bulky molecule is if you are having a bulky molecule what you expect the A should be the A should be A should be larger. So, the, the conductivity should be lower right and that is true whatever we have uh, 
applied or whatever hypothesis which we have derived for Stokes uh, using the to Stokes law is valid uh, if we are dealing with really bulky ions. They are complex ions you see, quaternary ammonium salts ions of that sort of category. Other ions like in the last class I have mentioned, if we talk about the alkali metals, the hydrodynamic radius becomes important. It is not just the radius of the uh, uh, ion which we are looking, we are also looking at the sheath of solvated molecules attached to the uh, ions which we are dealing with. So, we are not in really talking about the ionic radius, we are talking about the solvated radius of the solvated ion or the hydrodynamic radius of the ion. So, that uh, if, if you have a small ion, what happens? If you have a small ion, the small ion will have the charge density on that uh, ion will be much higher. Charge density means you have the probability of finding the electron will be much higher or on a lo lower uh, volume you are talking about. So, the concentration of the charge will be much higher. So, we can say that the higher charge density associated with the small ions than the larger ones. And since they are uh, the concentration of charge is high density on the surface, so they tend to get hydrated more easily. And if they are hydrated easily, you have uh, larger hydration radius or sphere. So, one of the paradox which we have here is we are going to talk about two paradoxes, one about the, uh, the mobility of the H plus ion and the OH minus ion being so different and another one is suppose we are talking about the alkali metals, molar conductivities of metals increases from lithium to cesium. Even though what you see lithium to cesium, if you see it is the uh, in a periodic table in the in the group, it is from top to bottom. So, if you go from top to bottom in a group in a periodic table, what happens? The atomic radii is supposed to uh, increase. Okay? So, and the same goes for the trend in the ionic radii. But what we are saying, if you have a uh, molar conductivities of alkali metal uh, is increasing from lithium to cesium, though the, uh, the ionic radius is increasing as well. So, it is not according to your Stokes expression which you had, right. This is large, how can this be large as well? They should be inversely proportional, right. So, this is the paradox which we have and this paradox is resolved when we realize that the radius A of this is the hydrodynamic uh, radius, it is in the Stoke formula and it is effective radius in the solution taking into account all the water molecules it is carrying in the sphere of hydration. Small ions which you if you have like lithium uh, uh, is the smallest one the small ions give rise to, you just see if uh, the ionic radius is there, if they are in picometers, 10 to the power minus 12 meters. So, these are the uh, values of the ionic radii. The very for small uh, ions give rise to stronger electric field than the larger ones. The electric field at the surface of any sphere of radius r is proportional to what? z d by r square and it follow, follows from that the smaller radius uh, the stronger the field should be. So, the ions are more extensively solvated than the bigger ones. Thus, a ion of small radius may have large hydrodynamic radius because of it, dra it drags uh, the solvent molecules uh, through the solution at it as it migrates. In solution, these metal ions are heavily hydro, usually metal, metal we are talking about cations, 
all cations are mainly metallic ones. So, all metal ions or cations are heavily hydrated. The primary hydration sphere is for 6 water molecules except for lithium which is for it is only 4 and there is ion dipole inter, uh, coulombic interaction what is the, uh, which is which is going to extend beyond this for the first sphere which you call. And what is this? This is the ion which is the uh, cation which we are talking about and the dipole of the water. The enthalpy of hydration increases as z square by r and enthalpy of uh, in, in the hydration decreases down the group. All sizes of the uh, hydrated ions decreases down the group. This is what we get as a crunch. All size, uh, size of the hydrated ion decreases down the group. This is the counter to the what we have in trends uh, of dehydrated ions down the group. It is just the opposite. Hence, the ionic mobility increases down the group. So, this is the paradox which we have. There are two exceptions which we have seen is NH plus ion in liquid ammonia and very high conductivity of uh, H plus ion and OH minus ion. If you look into this, if you go into the comparisons uh, I have given before, you see they are much higher and we will try to explain in the next lecture why is it so. Thank you so much.